Welcome, my name is Pastor Scotty Bockhaus, and we thank you for taking some time to listen to some audio recordings from the pulpit of the Riverview Baptist Church. Our desire is to show the Lord high, holy, and lift it up, as well as try to be a blessing to those through the Word of God. Please enjoy this message, and we pray that it will be a blessing to your life. And if you wouldn't mind to take your copy of the Word of God and turn with me to the Gospel Record of Mark. The Gospel Record of Mark and chapter number 10. The Gospel Record of Mark and chapter number 10. We're continuing to walk side by side with the Lord Jesus Christ through the Gospel Record of Mark. And I want to remind you that the Gospel Record of Mark is, shows Jesus Christ as the perfect servant. He is pictured as the ox. And here it is, shows that Jesus Christ is a man of action. It is written to the Roman mind. And to the Romans, they didn't care about long talks. They weren't looking for long, drawn-out discussions. They were looking for action. And the gospel record of Mark shows Jesus Christ by his actions that he was indeed the Son of God. And now we continue to see Jesus Christ as he begins his march to Jerusalem. He's already been walking with his disciples and warning them. We've already seen repeated warnings at what's going to happen when he goes to Jerusalem. And we're going to see more of that in the later part of the gospel record of Mark chapter number 10. But we take a pit stop as Jesus Christ is teaching and working with people, and some children want to see the Lord and Master. So pick it up with me, if you wouldn't mind, in the Gospel record of Mark, chapter number 10. The Gospel record of Mark, chapter number 10, and notice with me starting at verse 13. The Gospel record of Mark, chapter 10, verse 13, the Bible says this, And they brought young children to him, that he should touch them. And his disciples rebuked those that brought them. But when Jesus saw it, he was much displeased and said unto them, Suffer the little children to come unto me and forbid them not. For of such is the kingdom of God. Verily I say unto you, Whosoever shall not receive the kingdom of God as a little child he shall not enter therein. And he took them up in his arms and put his hands upon them and blessed them. And if you're in the habit of marking things in your Bible, notice a phrase with us in the gospel record of Mark in chapter number 10. The gospel record of Mark chapter number 10. Notice with me in verse 14 where Jesus said, suffer the little children to come. Suffer the little children to come. That word suffer carries the idea to permit, to allow. Suffer the little children to come. And with the Lord's help, we want to preach this message here and what Jesus sees about children. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much again for you being a wonderful God. And we know that you love little children. You love their faith and that you've put a responsibility in us adults to influence children to come closer to you. We're asking that we would be aware of our influence that we have and that we'd use it wisely, that we would encourage their faith rather than cause them to doubt your word and whom you are. Help open up this passage in a serious way that it could even affect eternity because of our understanding of this passage. Again, fill me with your precious spirit. I dare not trust my own. So the best I know how I surrender me, my thoughts, my ambitions, my goals, my desires. I give them all to you. And just ask that you get accomplished what you desire through your precious word tonight. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, as Jesus is taking a pit stop, he's doing a lot of work. And we've already covered Jesus' busy day, how people would line up to be healed. People would come with problems. People would come with their kids or their family members with devils. And he's working with a lot of people. Add to it, you have the criticism of the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the scribes, and even the Herodians. And so Jesus is quite busy. Well, the disciples have been busy themselves. Remember, we saw earlier in the gospel record of Mark that they hadn't had any leisure time. They barely had time to eat. And so if Jesus is busy, they're busy. And so as Jesus is busy about doing his normal day, we could see an interesting occurrence 
happen. The first thing I'd like to show you in this passage here is bringing the children to Christ. Bringing the children to Christ. Now parents begin to bring their children to see Jesus. And they just wanted Jesus to bless them, to pray over them. They just wanted Jesus to touch them. They came up just desiring for Jesus to pay attention to their little kids. Notice with me, if you don't mind, in verse 13. And they, that's the parents, brought young children to him that he should touch them. And his disciples rebuked them, those that brought them. So here's the parents. Can you ask Jesus? Can he touch them? And the disciples would see that Jesus is working with someone. And they said, no, put the kids out of here. He's too busy for this. He's got more important things to do. I understand you're, you want your baby touched. That's fine. But can't you see he's doing important things? And they start rebuking him. The word rebuke here is the idea that it is a hard um, correction. Trying to tell them, you are not right by bringing these kids here. What are you even thinking about bringing these kids here? Don't bother the master this way. And all the disciples are involved in this. You can almost imagine Jesus is working with someone and the disciples have a perimeter around him. And in their mind, they're doing what's best. In their mind, they're trying to help Jesus Christ. They're trying to help the master. But in fact, they're displeasing the master. And so they're rebuking the parents. Don't, no, don't bring your kids. He's got more important things to do. But notice Jesus' reaction, verse 14. But when Jesus saw it, he was much displeased. Notice this. He wasn't just displeased. He was much displeased. He said unto them, Suffer the little children to come unto me, and forbid them not, for of such, these children, is the kingdom of God. He stated to allow the children to come and never stop a child from coming to Christ. There's something about children that Jesus said they're just, it's like the kingdom of God. There's something about the simplicity of their faith. Something about the simplicity of understanding who Christ is. People who study uh, child psychologists or ecology Understand there's a principle, there's a golden age of learning for children in between birth up to five to seven years old. During those years, they will learn more than what they will learn the rest of their life. Things that we take it for granted. For example, they have to learn how to walk. Now for us, we take it for granted. Most of us can sort of get by without stumbling. But for them... It, you have, they have to think about it. Remember, you have one parent who holds the child and the other one says, all right, come to me. And the parent lets go of the child and the child steadily goes. They have to learn how to walk. They have to learn to talk. Do you know that before a child says his first word, the child understands 2,000 words? They're understanding before they can even speak. They're listening. There's a golden age of learning. People who study such things tell us that by the age three, their likes and dislikes are beginning to be formed. By age five, their personality is forming. By age seven, all of those things are set. There's a golden age where we could influence them for Christ or we can influence them to disregard the things of the Lord. During those times, the golden ages of learning. The Catholic Church understood this. The Jesuits, which were the militant arm of the Catholic Church, said this. That you let us have your children up to age seven, and we can give them back to you. We'll not worry. They'll always be ours. There's a golden age where they could learn to follow after God. They could learn how to love God or they could learn to hate God just based on those ages. You take a Moses, a Moses who his mother gave him to the Lord and said, God, you got to take care of him and put him in an ark of the bulrushes, put him in the Nile River. And then he was found by Pharaoh's daughter. 
And God allowed it so Moses' mother could nurse him. And back then they would nurse a child and wean that child until about five years old. So she knew she only had him for five years. For five years, she had to instill everything about faith and God that she could in those five years. People make the mistake today that they say that children can't understand things about faith. They can't understand things about the Bible. They don't understand about the Bible and following after God. And therefore, we shouldn't even attempt to teach them until later on. And what a mistake that is. Think about Moses. I want you to hold your finger here. We're coming back. But Moses' mother influenced him so greatly that it affected the rest of his life. Turn with me, if you wouldn't mind, to the book of Hebrews, chapter number 11. The book of Hebrews in chapter number 11. Hebrews we often title in, verse, in chapter number 11 as the hall of faith. And what we see all throughout chapter 11 is by faith, by faith, by faith. And we understand that faith is described in chapter 11. Faith is defined in chapter 12 and verse 2, looking unto Jesus. And so as these folks looked unto Jesus, their faith produced an action. And as Jochebed, that is Moses' mother, influenced Moses she only had him for five years, yet those five years of influence and teaching him about the Lord, teaching him about God, teaching him to follow the Lord, changed the rest of his life. Notice what the Bible says in Hebrews chapter number 11, and I want us to read it four verses, and I want you as we do that to pay attention to the verbs. Remember what a verb is? A verb is an action. It, it is the action that is done by the object, by the subject. Notice the verbs, the actions that Moses made for the Lord all because of the influence of a mother. Notice with me in Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 24. By faith Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt. Egypt, for he had respect unto the recompense of the reward. By faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. Because of the influence of his mother, it allowed God to work in his life later on. And because of that influence, because of her instilling in just those five years, it helped him to have the faith to follow God, and it helped him to make choices. Notice again in verse number 24, by faith Moses, when he was come to years, this isn't talking about 80 years old, it's talking about that he had a choice when he could be called the prince of of Egypt, when he could be called even the heir of Pharaoh, he refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He said, I'd rather choose to be a Hebrew than to be choose to be an Egyptian. I'd rather suffer the affliction. Notice this in verse number 25. He choo choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. This is because of the influence of his mother only for five years. He made a choice, a, a purposeful, intentional choice to be identified with the slaves of, of Egypt, the Hebrews, rather than to be identified with the palace. He did that as a young man. Where did that come from? The influence of his mother. Verse number 26, esteeming the reproach of Christ, greater riches than treasures in Egypt. Here's another math term. We have the greater symbol, right? That, that Pac-Man thing, just the mouth. And he said, the, the reproach of Christ is greater. That symbol with the open arrow is greater than the riches and treasures in Egypt. 
I'd rather suffer with Christ that is greater than having all of the riches. Where did he learn that? From his mother. Five years of his life. Verse 27, by faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured, notice this, as seeing him who is invisible. For five years, Moses' mother taught Moses about the one that is invisible, about God. And he made decisions in his life to identify with God and Christ rather than to have an easy life. Rather than to have the pleasures of sin for a season. Rather even sparking and risking the wrath of Pharaoh by identifying himself as a Hebrew. Where did that come from? His mother influencing his life five years. We could talk about Samuel, once again, a mother who had him for five years and gave him to God. He was now under the authority of Eli and he still followed after God because of the influence of a mother. Again, we could see those decisions that was made. Moses refused, Moses choosing, Moses esteeming, Moses forsook. All because of the influence on a child. This idea to bring a child to Christ at an early age to influence them, to teach them. This is what Jesus is saying. Let the children come. Suffer the children to come. Bring them unto me. Which brings me to a second thing as we turn back to the gospel record of Mark chapter number 10. Not only do we see this idea of allowing the children to come, to bring the children to Christ... We also see this, the faith of a child towards Christ. The faith of a child towards Christ. So Jesus takes some time to explain why he wants the children to come. Notice with me in verse 15. Verily I say unto you, whosoever shall not receive the kingdom of God as a little child, he shall not enter therein. And he took them up in his arms and put his hands upon them and blessed them. But Jesus takes some time to explain here. Here he explains that you have to have the faith of a child. What is the faith of a child? It is a simple faith. Do you know that children will believe what an adult tells them? Even the most fantastical things, they will tell them and there's such a simple faith of a child. It's us adults that make things complicated. We make things complicated. If you tell a child that they're supposed to give to the Lord, they say, okay, I'll do that. But an adult will say, well, I know I should, but the reason why I can't is, and they'll list all the reasons why they can't. You tell a child that they're supposed to sing for the Lord, and they'll get a hymn book and do the best they can. But an adult said, yeah, I'm supposed to ching for the Lord, but let me tell you the reasons why I can't. You tell a child that they're supposed to read their Bible, okay, I'm supposed to be the read the Bible. And you get the adults and they'll tell you every reason why they can't. You see, faith is simple. We make things complicated. The Bible even gives that reference later on in the book of Corinthians that we're supposed to do everything in simplicity and godly sincerity. That whenever you come to the place in your life where you say it's complicated, that's not of God. Faith in God and obedience in Him is simple. We make things complicated. Why can't you obey this? Well, I would, but, and again, we've all been there. But there's something about the childlike faith. If you want to be the best servant, you approach the Bible like a child. If the Bible says it, then do it. It's that simple. It is us that makes things complicated. We make things difficult. I want to remind you of some spiritual characteristics of a child. What are some spiritual characteristics of a child that makes it so simple for them? Well, first of all, we know that children naturally know that there is a God. 
Every child who is born knows that there is a God. Someone has to get a hold of them and convince them that there is no God. But every child has an innate sense that there is a God. They may not know the details about him, but they know that there is a God. By the way, the book of Romans chapter 1 tells us that. Everyone is born with the light that there is a God. Second thing that we know about children and their spiritual characteristics is that children can know the truth of God's word. That's why we sang those songs earlier today. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Can a child before he's saved understand that truth? Yes. Yes. A child can know the truth of God's word. The B-I-B-L-E. Yes, that's the book for me. Can they understand that even if they don't have full comprehension? Yes. Yes. Can they understand the principle that Jesus loves me? This I know, for the Bible tells me so. How about Jesus loves the little children of the world? Red and yellow, black and white. They are precious in his sight. Jesus loves the little children of the world. Can they understand the truth of God's word? Yes, they can. That's why we instruct our nursery workers. It doesn't matter if it's a brand new baby. That nursery time is an influential time. It's not a babysitting time. It's a time where we're going to sing Jesus loves me to those kids. Even if they don't have an understanding, we're going to try to tell them Bible stories because they can grasp the truth of God's word, the simple truth of God's word. God created me. God loves me. God has a plan for me. God wants me to be saved. God loves me. They can understand simple truths, the truth of God's word, and you can instill that from a child, and they can understand it. We know that children, by faith, can receive Christ as their Savior. Children, by faith. Do you know that most people who come to know Christ as their Savior come to know Jesus Christ below the age of 18? Most people who are saved are saved below the age of 18. Now we understand that there is a time that they have to have an understanding. We're not expecting a two-year-old to get saved. But children can get saved early. How? By them understanding that they're a sinner. And because of their sin, that there's consequences. How was that accomplished? By having consistent, um, <clears throat> by consistent correction in your house. That if you have consistent correction in their house, they'll understand that there's a consequence for my sin. And the more established that is, the earlier that they can understand that principle and get saved. That's why we have bus kids who don't have any consequences for their actions. That at seven and nine years old, they can't understand salvation because they still can't understand that they're a sinner. And because of their sin, that they've offended a holy, righteous God. And so there's not a certain age, but it's based off of their understanding. But children, even at a young age, can understand that they're a sinner. And because of their sin, that they've offended a holy, righteous God. But the good news is, is that Jesus died for them. And all they have to do is accept Christ as their Savior. Now, of course, we know that they're not going to be able to understand all the elements of soteriology and what the purpose of justification is and what happens when I get redeemed, but they can understand the simple principle is Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. They can understand that I do wrong and there's consequences, but Jesus died for me and the best I know how I can accept him. They can understand simple truths and children can get saved. And praise the Lord, when someone gets saved, if it's a little child, that's one of the most wonderful things. We all rejoice when we hear of an adult. I had an evangelist in years ago who gave his testimony that during the civil rights uh, movements in the 60s, he had a black preacher come up to him and try to witness to him. And he said, listen here, he was part of a biker gang and said, if you ever tell me about Jesus again, I'll kill you. And he meant it. For years, no one witnessed to him and he became a hardened criminal. But one day someone came with the gospel and that old biker got saved and he got saved and he became an evangelist and traveled all around. And praise the Lord when we hear testimonies like that. But you know what's more precious than a testimony? Than having a little child who came to know Christ and said, because I came to know Christ, I never had a face any of that. 
I never had to get drugs and alcohol. I never had to deal with a broken home and a bad relationship. I just had to trust God and look at what, by His grace, what He did in my life and what He protected me from. Isn't that a wonderful testimony? A child can by faith receive them. Notice this. Here's another uh, spiritual characteristic of children. Children can worship the Lord and praise Him. Children can worship the Lord and praise Him. Kids can worship God. They can sing praises to God. In fact, they're probably more sincere than we are. We have the habit of breaking the, the second commandment when we open our hymn book. You say, really? Yeah, take the Lord's name in vain. How do we do that? Taking the, name's Lord, uh, the Lord's name in vain is any time that we have His name on our lips, but it's not currently burning in our heart. We all sing songs, but we're not paying attention to the words. But you know, children, they can sincerely sing praises to God. Oh, there's something wonderful about a kid making up his own words and just out in the backyard saying, I love you, Lord. I love you, Lord. I love you. There's something sincere about that. Something pure about that. Oh, in my mind's eye, I could just see God smiling because of that. Just the simple, pure, instead of thinking about what's for lunch and did I turn on the pot roast and while we're singing. We've all been there. There's something simplistic and honest about a child who's able to worship towards the Lord. Something else, a spiritual characteristic, a child can pray to God. A child can pray to the Lord. If I could give a personal testimony, I am still seeing answers to prayer today of prayers that I prayed when I was seven years old. God can hear the prayers of children. And he can answer the prayer. In fact, he can answer some fantastical prayers of children. I know preacher friends of mine that if they're really sick, they don't go talk to their preacher friends. They go grab some children. Something about children getting a hold of God and praying. They can be taught to pray. That's why we need to teach them to pray at a young age and get them to pray and let them be confident in the prayer and let them know who they're talking to and that they can tell him anything. If you could teach a child that they could tell God anything, then when they're adult, they'll have no problems. I don't know how many times I've got an adult that I, trying to say, why don't you tell the Lord about that? Well, that just seems too small. No, it's not. Why don't you tell the Lord about it? Well, it just seems too big. But if you could get a child and teach them to pray and they could tell God anything and everything, they will be better off for the rest of their life because they have that childlike faith. Until someone gets a hold of them and tells them, you're not supposed to pray like that. Just let them pray. Something else that we know of spiritual characteristics about children is that children can serve the Lord and be used of God. You go throughout the Bible and find the children that was used of God. An eight-year-old king who was used to bring reform throughout his kingdom. You take a Samuel who heard the voice of God and responded and was able to tell the adult what God was planning on doing. Children could be used of God. Even if it's something as simple as a little lad bringing in his lunch and Jesus feeding 7,000 with it. Children can serve God. In fact, the quicker that we could teach them to serve God, and that's why I love the kids who do the offering plates and kids who are, are greeters at the doors and kids who are able to do different things. We could teach them that they can be used of God and they should be used of God and they'll grow up with a mindset of service the rest of their life. But to teach them, but they can be used of God. How many children could be used to give someone a hug at the right time? And give them the encouragement that they need. Again, forgive the personal illustration. My wife and I were part of retirement homes for years and years and years. And when Serena was born, we took her to the retirement home. And we taught all of our kids to hug all the retirement home people. And to love on them. And they sang songs. Even today, during the uh, summer, when we go over to the retirement home, my kids will still sing before them. Because they can be used to be an encouragement. Let me tell you, those retirement home people would rather hear those kids sing than me preach. So, 
But they could be used to encourage. They could be used in great ways. They could be used of God. There is another characteristic, that spiritual characteristic that children have. Is that children can hear the voice of God. Because they're not complicating things. The Bible says in the Beatitude, Blessed are those that are simple, for they shall see God. When we make things so complicated, where's God at? God says, I'm here. Don't you see me? But kids can be led of the Lord. And talk again, go to Samuel. God spoke to Samuel. Samuel, Samuel. Why? Because he knew the child would be able to respond. Kids can listen to God. They can open up the Bible and let God speak to them through His Word. They'll actually listen to the preacher and expect God to teach them something. They can, with simple faith, they can learn and hear God's voice. The faith of a child towards Christ. But there's one more thing that I want to show you. And that was something that we hit the chapter before. Turn with me, if you don't mind, in the Gospel record of Mark, chapter number 9. The Gospel Record of Mark, chapter number 9. Now, as we have the story in Gospel Record of Mark, chapter 10, we have Jesus who is busy, but these people trying to bring their children to Christ, and the disciples rebuking them. And Jesus said, no, let the children come. And then he explained why. But in the previous chapter, we could see Jesus warned about something very important. The idea of offending a child away from Christ. Offending a child away from Christ. Notice with me in the gospel record of Mark chapter 9. And notice with me in verse 42. The gospel record of Mark chapter 9 and verse 42. And whosoever shall offend one of these little ones that believe in me, it were better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck and he were cast into the sea. This idea of offend carries the idea of putting a stumbling block, causing them to stumble. It carries the idea that whosoever causes a child not to look to God by faith, they're in trouble for God. In fact, God says, if I get a hold of them, it would be better for them to have a millstone, an anchor, put around their neck and they drown in the depth of the sea. If I get a hold of them, it's going to be worse than that. When God starts speaking like that, that's pretty serious. By the way, this is why we need to get children involved and teach them to sing before they realize it's not cool to sing. To teach them to go to church before they realize it's not cool to go to church. To teach them how to give and how to soul win before they realize it's not cool to give. Once they get to teenagers, it's starting to get too bad. Getting those children and teach them to do these things that will carry them through those teenage years. But Jesus warns not to offend, not to offend, not to cause their faith in the Lord to stumble. He gives a very strong warning. So with that, we could just put a period there, but then it's still oblivious. It's still very vague. What does it mean to cause a child to stumble in their faith? How is it that a child can cause to stumble in their faith? I'm going to give you some things, but let me give you... um, a principle before we do, that when we teach, we have two types of teaching that are always going on. We have active teaching and passive teaching. Active teaching is what I am purposely trying to teach you. Passively teaching is the things that they're picking up without me instructing them. We're always having two types of teaching going on. One is from what I am purposely teaching. The other ones is what they're observing in my life. Remember the phrase, do as I say, not as I do. They will pick up what you do before they pick up what you say. So how is it that someone could cause a child's faith to stumble? Here, here's a list of things. First of all, Causing a child to doubt the Bible by not reading it or obeying it themselves. Causing a child to doubt the Bible by not reading it or obeying themselves. Remember, we have the idea of passive teaching. If you have an adult that tells the child, you need to obey the Bible, but then they won't read it themselves, you know what it's teaching them? The Bible's not important. 
You have an adult who says, you need to obey the Bible. They take them to church and they hear the preacher say, obey the Bible. But their parents said, I'm not going to do that. You're causing the child to doubt the Bible. They're teaching them that the Bible is not important. And you're going to cause the child to stumble. And there are many of a parent who is in trouble with God. Because that's what they taught their child. They didn't say, let's have a class on why the Bible's not true. But instead, by their actions, they taught them, the Bible is not true. That's why I don't obey it. What's another reason why we cause a child's faith to stumble? We also see causing a child to disregard the importance of church by a parent's unfaithfulness. Causing a child to disregard the importance of church by a parent's unfaithfulness. Now someone will say, well, I don't think church that's important. You know the Bible says that Jesus died for the church? You know that Jesus loves the church? And that's not the ambiguous term. That's a different saying that Jesus loved the world, for God so loved the world. Jesus died for the church as well. The institution, the local assembling together. And we show how what we think of the importance of the church based off of our faithfulness to the church. If you don't think it's important to go to church, your kids are going to learn that it's not important to go to church. And if they don't love the things of God, they're not going to love God. By the way, if you don't love this book, how can you love the author of this book? Amen. There's an important principle here. Remember, you're not teaching a course about why you shouldn't go to church. You're teaching them by your actions. That is what they're learning. So causing a child to doubt the Bible by not reading it or obeying themselves. Causing a child to disregard the importance of church by a parent's unfaithfulness. We also see another thing. Causing a child to disbelieve God's goodness by complaining and not going to God in prayer. Causing a child to disbelieve God's goodness by complaining and not going to God in prayer. You say, is that a true thing? Read the book of Numbers. Over and over and over you see the word murmur. That word murmur is complaining. You know, every time you complain, what you're saying is that God is not good and God is not right. And if you want to be honest and do a death tally in the Bible, the sin that God killed the most people for was complaining. Don't believe me? Read the book of Numbers. When we complain, especially in front of our children... We are teaching them that God is not good and that God is not right. You know what we should do? We should go to God in prayer. If you truly believe that God was good and God was right, you go to God in prayer and say, God, this is what I need. That's what the children of Israel should have done when they were hungry and they wanted something. Don't you think God would have given them good meat to eat if they would have went to him in prayer instead of complaining and saying, it's not right. We're going to die. God hates us. And they even got to the place where they said, God hates us. That's pretty bad. And when a child sees how you respond, they start to learn, even though you're not sitting down and having a class, you're teaching them that God is not good. It causes them to disbelieve God's goodness when you complain. How can someone cause a child's faith to stumble? Causing a child to doubt the Bible by not reading it or obeying themselves. Causing a child to disregard the importance of church by a parent's unfaithfulness. Causing a child to disbelieve God's goodness by complaining and not going to God in prayer. And causing a child to distrust God's character by not being consistent in discipline. Causing a child to distrust God's character by not being consistent in discipline. There is a principle. How a child sees his earthly father is how he sees his heavenly father. And if he has a father that's not consistent in punishment or in correction and trying to help them to be better, they're going to see a God that will let them get away with whatever they want. 
You see, how we train our children teaches them how to see God. Sometimes parents will say, why is my teenager like this? Let me tell you why. It's because you taught them about God's character that was incorrect. And now they have a bad view of God that needs to be corrected. I was dealing with a pastor not too long ago. And he was saying, I'm worried about my folks. What should I do? They need to see God. Everything's based off of their vision of God. Let them see who God is. But they got this problem. They got this problem. Yes, but their major problem is they don't see God for whom he is. That is most of the problem that we have in American Christianity. That is most of the problem why some people don't get saved. Is because they see their God Based off of how they see their parent. An absent parent, an absent God. A non-caring parent, a non-caring God. A lording parent, a lording God. You see, how we train our children in discipline. You know the Bible actually says that if we don't discipline our children, we do not love them. A non-loving parent, a non-loving God. A parent who doesn't care what a child does. A child sees a God who doesn't care what they do. And that's further from the truth. How do we cause a child's faith to stumble? Causing a child to doubt the Bible by not reading it or obeying it themselves. Causing a child to disregard the importance of church by a parent's unfaithfulness. Causing a child to disbelieve God's goodness by complaining and not going to God in prayer. Causing a child to distrust God's character by not being consistent in discipline. And the last thing, I'm sure that you can make some more, but these are some major ones. Causing a child to disobey authority by parents gossiping against the pastor and other authority. You know, there, used, there was a dynamic change. Back when I was a child, now we always get the thing back in the day. Back in my day, when there was an incident at school, my parents believed the teacher over the, me. Why? They backed authority. And that's the proper response. Today, it's the teacher's fault and not the student's fault. And you know what you do when you erode that authority? You erode your authority and you erode God's authority. If you teach them that you don't have to obey authority, why should they obey God's authority? If you teach them they shouldn't obey other authority, you'll find that they won't obey your authority. You see, this is a dangerous thing. How do you do that? By gossiping. Oh, there's been many a people who have roast preacher on the way home and talking about this. Well, a child hears that. Even something as simple as talking about the president. I don't care who the president is. You should always refer to him as president so and so. And you should never use derogatory terms. I don't care who the president is because he is an authority. And you teach your kids not to listen to the president. You're teaching the children not to listen to you. You teach your your children not to obey the police. You're teaching them not to obey you. You see, God has set up an authority. And we wonder why we have anarchy in our world today. It's because we've, dis, we've broken this picture of God's authority. Why should I obey God's authority? Why? I don't have to obey my teacher, my parents. Well, why, should I, why would his authority be any different? And you know who determines Whether a child is going to obey authority or not, the parent. The parent. So when you see this list, we're not talking about the public school teachers or the college professors. We see that we have a responsibility to show our kids who God is by our own character and our own obedience. If you want more on this, we're not going to turn there for now. Deuteronomy chapter 6. Read away. And you'll see everything that I just said in this list in Deuteronomy chapter 6. Where it instructs the parent to teach the children 
along the way when they wake up, when they go to sleep. To have the scripture in front of them at all times. To have a regard. To remind them of God's character. Oh, let's turn there. Deuteronomy chapter 6. If I'm going to describe all of it, I might as well just show it. Good. Notice with me, Deuteronomy chapter 6, right at the very beginning of the Bible, the fifth book in, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy in chapter number 6. And you go ahead and take Deuteronomy chapter 6 and you compare it to this list that I gave here. And you could see the responsibility that God gave to parents, especially fathers, and their teaching of these young children. Deuteronomy chapter 6. Notice with me as we pick it up. Ah, let's start from the beginning. Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 1. Now these are the commandments, the statutes, and the judgments, that's all the word of God, which the Lord your God commanded to teach you. Why? That ye may do them in the land where you go to possess it. And notice this, that. When you see that word that, it's saying Why there? Why should you, are the commandments and statutes and judgments there? That thou mightest fear the Lord thy God to keep all of his statutes and his commandments, which I command thee, thou and thy son and thy son's son. Why? All the days of thy life and that thy days may be prolonged. So all the days of your life. So that way they could have a prolonged life. Verse number three. Hear therefore, O Israel, and observe to do it, that it may be well with thee, and that ye may increase mightily as the Lord God of thy fathers have promised thee in the land that floweth with milk and honey. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy might. And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart, and thou shalt teach them them diligently unto thy children and shall talk of them when thou sittest in thine house and when thou walkest by the way and when thou liest down and when thou risest up and thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thy hand and they shall be frontlets between thine eyes and thou shalt write them upon the post of thy house and upon thy gates and it shall be when the Lord thy God hath brought thee into the land which he swore unto thy fathers to Abraham to Isaac and to Jacob to give thee great and goodly cities which thou buildest not and houses full of all good things which thou fillest not and wells diggest which thou diggest not and vineyards and olive trees which thou plantest not but thou have eaten and be full then beware beware lest thou forget the Lord which brought thee out of the <coughs> forth out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage thou shalt fear the Lord thy God and serve him and shall swear by his name and it goes on but that covers it We are to diligently teach our children these things so that way they will trust in God and enjoy the life that God gave them rather than face the destruction and ruin that comes when they turn away from God. The Bible says, suffer the little children to come. You couldn't do any better in your life than to teach children to follow after God. You couldn't do any better in your life To take someone and go alongside with them and say, let's walk to God together. Encourage their faith. Teach them to follow after God all of the days of their life. Thank you for listening to this audio message. This is Pastor Scotty Bockhaus. And I encourage you to take this information that you just received and make a specific decision to follow after the Lord. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, let me beg you to take the time to receive Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. If you are saved, I encourage you to make a decision in your life to help you get closer with the Lord. If there's anything specific we can do to be a blessing or to pray for you, we encourage you. Look us up on the internet at riverviewbc.com. Once again, that's riverviewbc.com. Or if you would prefer to call us, you can give us a call at area code 920 920- 
920-530-6308. Once again, that number is 920-530-6308. If there's anything we can do to be a blessing or an encouragement to you, please let us know. We would love to make ourselves available. Thank you.